sitting back watching MNF and how it is presented on TV. The NBA has really taken over as the best sport in America by a lot. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball. We're doing another season preview podcast for a team that honestly I probably uh, am the least sure about of any team in the NBA and that is the Los Angeles Lakers and to discuss the Los Angeles Lakers I'm joined by one of the hosts of the Locked On Lakers podcast and that is of course Anthony Irwin back for his third year doing the team preview. Anthony Anthony, welcome back. How's it going, man? It's, uh, it's good to have you back on. And this team looks uh, decidedly different to what it has over the past couple of seasons. So lots for us to uh, to unpack today. Michael Bolton's ready. Let's get to it. To it. All right, let's, uh, let's start by looking at uh, this Lakers team, which I'm sure is going to have, I was going to say all eyes on them. They already they always do, but it's going to be even more intense this season. Big, uh, big year for this team, of course, with LeBron James joining them. But the projected record is something which has been, uh, I guess, debated quite a bit around the NBA. Vegas has them at the moment at 48 and a half. Some people are thinking 50's a lock, especially with James there. Others are maybe not so sure about how the team fits together. Anthony, you've gone at 48 and 34, so one of the few, uh, few team hosts that goes under the Vegas line. Why are you, I guess, more pessimistic than some others may be about this Lakers team? I think it has more to do with the optimism across betting lines, period, right? Like the, the Lakers are such a public team that they're going to, the, everything's going to be set a little higher because yep. Laker fans are going to bet anyway. So you may as well set the thing a little bit higher. Laker, it's not like they're going to be prudent in, in their uh, prognostication here. So I, I think you, you set it a little higher and, and you see where the Lakers fall there. 48 is still a, you know, a significant improvement on last season. They show plenty of signs, but of course, teams that, that de- do tend to change their roster over quite significantly, it can take a bit of time for them to gel. You have got the projected leading scorer on this team as LeBron James. LeBron James. I don't think many people would argue too much with that, Anthony, but we'll start this way. LeBron was yeah, excellent in fantasy last year. He played all, all 82 games for the first time in his career. He just missed out on playing 37 minutes per night, and he was the fourth overall player in per-game value. Do you think that, A, he can go back-to-back back with 82 games, and do you think that his playing time reduces this season in LA? Because that's the impression I seem to get. 82 games seems like a stretch. I don't think he'll he'll go back to back there, and and his minutes are going to diminish a little bit. They're 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 going to drop a little bit. And uh, that said, though, the other thing that I think is a bigger factor is he has been on the record saying that he wants to take kind of a reduced role in creating. He spoke to Magic Johnson, and they worked together to build a team of other creators that they're on the court with him. So all of those things kind of come together, and he's still LeBron James. You still want to have him on your fantasy team, but he, he his value, the value may not necessarily be there with James this year. He's a guy that you know, I've heard many people say, oh, I'd, I'd take him at number one in fantasy drafts, and I just no. uh, don't believe that. He hasn't been the number one guy for many years, and even last season, he wasn't the number one player. He was fourth overall, and I do think that takes a step back from where he was, was last season. He's a fine mid to late first round type of guy in that seven to 12 type of range, but not in that top five there type of an area. And again, I, I do agree with you that there will be somewhat of, of a step back, whether that's in the assist numbers dropping, the minutes dropping a little bit. He still will lead the team in scoring. He's still going to put up excellent numbers. But I think expecting a complete repeat of last season is not what we should be looking at for LeBron as we head into this season. But we know we know who he is. We know what he does. He's going to be really solid value in that first round. But if you go too high on him ahead of Anthony Davis or James Harden, I don't think that's the uh, the way you should be looking at LeBron for this coming season. In terms of of um, of injuries on this team. And the big one that we're looking at again heading into the season is Lonzo Ball, who suffered multiple knee injuries last season. And then it was revealed after the season was over that he did in fact suffer a torn meniscus. The aim is for him to be ready for preseason and training camp. But it is a level of concern that there has been multiple knee injuries with Lonzo already and that uh, undisclosed meniscus 
that came out around the uh, time that there was a few trade rumors floating around. <laughs> yeah, that's the big one there. Like the, the timing of that, I don't think was an accident at all. The the Lakers were they were never really negotiating with the Spurs. I don't think the conversations ever got particularly far, but it was pretty obviously Lonzo Ball's camp. If it wasn't, it, it definitely wasn't LeVar Ball himself, but somebody from Lonzo's camp let it be known that, oh, hey, by the way, Spurs, you you, you might want to check in on this knee. And and then, you know, it gets they, they, that that his team, his camp doesn't want or wants to be in Los Angeles. They don't want to be in San Antonio. They don't want to be in a small market. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. But and, and by all by all reports. He's going to be healthy by the time training camp comes around. How, whether he's a hundred percent or ninety percent or eighty-five, that remains to be seen. I, I Lonzo's a gamble. Like he is, <laughs> I don't know if I would touch him uh, based on how high he's going to go. All the Lakers in general seem to go too high, but but Lonzo in particular, I just the, the downside is there in in ways that really scare me. His current rank on Yahoo is 53. I don't think that's a, a terrible bet. He was the 56th ranked player last season, and that's, of course, with uh, historically bad shooting, 44% true shooting, 36 from the line. That's from the field, 45 from the line, and 31 from three. I think if there are any of those num- numbers we expect to jump up, it'll be the free throw percentage will be the biggest riser. He was a guy that wasn't a great free throw shooter, but he was hitting at least 65, 66% of his free throws in college. So you could easily see a 20, 25 percentage point jump in that. He could get the uh, field goal percentage to 40 41 and he had a few stretches during the season anthony where he was hitting those shots with the pretty regular numbers and and if he gets those two say he gets to 40 70 and 32 which they're not great numbers but they're not terrible then he becomes a top 30 type of player um how much confidence do you have in, in at least some part of the shooting at least coming around to maybe being below average rather than horrible I think it all starts from the free throw line, not just in statistical manners that he becomes more efficient, obviously, the more free throws and the higher free throw rate that he has. But it, from a confidence standpoint, there were moments last year as he was struggling from the free throw line that he very obviously, when he was driving to the basket, did not want to get fouled. And what that does is it makes him contort. He's already not a very good finisher, but when he's actively avoiding contact as a, almost religiously, he contorts his body in ways that make it really hard to finish. And it was just a, even his drives themselves, like he would teams started playing him challenging, daring him to finish at the rim. Uh, and, and not even through contact. It was just try ahead, go ahead and try to finish. And, and he just wouldn't shoot it anywhere near the rim. And it just, it had this weird kind of crap rolling downhill, uh, issue <laughs> for the rest of his game. So if he if he jumps up there to 60-65%, I think that will have a huge impact on the rest of his game as as he won't be as uh, reticent to, to get to the free throw line. He was a guy that shot 70% on his two-pointers at UCLA. Now, of course, he's never going to get anywhere near that number, and nobody really is. But he was able to finish to a certain degree, and he hit his threes at a fairly high rate there as well. We're not expecting him to become an excellent shooter, but I think he can become at least a below-average one. And as I said, that takes him up to being a top 25, top 30 guy because he gets assists in huge amounts, over seven per game last season, seven rebounds, 1.7 steals, 0.8 blocks, and still hit 1.33s, even though it took quite a few attempts to get there. But I guess the big question mark, aside from the injury this season, Anthony, is is he going to be the starter? And is he going to play those 34 minutes per night he played last season? Or is Rajon Rondo going to come in and steal it from underneath him? I don't think Rondo's going to steal the starting position from him. There are some who do, and th- there are some who I respect who do kind of wonder about that. But I, I don't think he'll take take the starting position from him. But he will take minutes. Like last year, the the second best point guard on the roster, or the the backup point guard on the roster was Tyler Ennis. Yep. So in those in those I- I- any time there was it, Lonzo Ball was healthy, he was going to play as much as he possibly could. This year, if Lonzo kind of sort of struggles, has an off night or whatever. There is a there is a legitimate point guard sitting there behind him, and and that might affect. That's the thing, injuries and minutes are the two concerns I hear I have here with with Lonzo because the Lakers are also trying to win. Like they they have legitimate win and playoff aspirations, expectations even. And if Lonzo struggles and Rondo is is the more predictable 
player in terms of production, I, that's where you're really going to see Lonzo's minutes really go down, and, and he'll play more with the bench unit. Yeah, look, that, that's a definite possibility, and it is a risk there. Look, he's got he's got that upside, but he's also got that downside. I don't think he's ever falling yeah. outside the top 100 because he's still going to play, and he's still going to put up those numbers. But there is more of, a, of an up and down with his playing time. How much um, how much negativity or how much blame do you place on Luke Walton for the way that he played Lonzo at the end of last season, where over the last seven games of the season, he topped him at out at over 40 minutes per game, and in those other three games, he went at 39, 38, and 37, and then he hurt his knee again. Do you, do you think that that was poorly managed by Walton and do you think that Luke will be uh, looking to put his you know, step back a little bit because it happened with Ingram as well Kuzma was playing 40 minutes a night after spraining his ankle it seemed to be poor management I know the Lakers didn't have you know, many guys and there were lots of injuries but there were other guys they could have played there it just seemed like a poor management of future assets by a Walton in that situation yeah the, the minutes across the board were kind of weird last year you had the Randall not starting games at the beginning of the year and not getting consistent minutes despite being very obviously the the best at least small ball center on the team and he was he, he was very obviously shortchanged in terms in terms of minutes as the season came to a close last year the Lakers weren't in any kind of playoff run so the fact that those guys were playing such long minutes was also also kind of struck me as odd. I, I, this team is a lot deeper than it was last year. Yep. And and that is going to kind of force Luke's hand. He's not going to the, – the, the, the option isn't really going to be there unless <laughs> unless they really are devastated by injuries that he – Luke will have to play guys fewer minutes across the board. So that's going to help. And really, I mean, it, it just gets back to and, and it I always feel kind of bad because it sounds like I'm crapping on Ennis, but but he's not a legitimate NBA player, and yet he was forced into a, a legitimate NBA role. And it made it so much more obvious when when Lonzo was healthy that he needed to be out there. This year, like even even beyond Ennis, Rondo being playing Tyler Ennis's role is gonna make a huge difference in, in the minutes allocation. And then also Alex Caruso is is probably also better than than Ennis. So so you have legitimate options there going down the roster and and Ingram we saw can play point guard. I just think you can see there's there's no reason that any Lakers should be should be playing insane minutes this year, including yeah. LeBron. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's going to be the case. And that's going to be something we have to pay attention to. Now, the guy that you did list as your breakout player for this season is Brandon Ingram, someone who did see quite significant minutes last year. He also only played 59 games due to multiple injuries during the season. I worry a little bit for Ingram coming into this season. LeBron obviously comes into the starting lineup. It's not going to be moving Ingram out of that lineup, I wouldn't think. But he's also going to be playing uh, less with the ball in his hands. As much as LeBron wants to say he doesn't want to have the ball in his hands as often, it still means that Ingram's and Ingram's success last year, Anthony really came from those times when he did have the ball in his hands over the part last 20 games of the year. He averaged five assists per game. I think that's going to be hard for him to get back to that level. He also shot 45% from three in those last 20 games, um, which was you know some really strong shooting from him. He took big steps forward, but I worry that him for this season, whether he can continue that growth with James there, but you seem to have uh, not not as many concerns of Ingram taking that next step forward. The thing that I'm really interested to see with Ingram is if he – because he started shooting the ball better as the season went along last year. Yep. And and I want to know if he trusts that production or, or that improvement. If he does and he is more comfortable releasing shots uh, as a catch-and-shoot kind of guy, then that's going to be really interesting to see. And that's going to decide a lot of his value, right? Because if he – he started hitting threes and, and he hadn't really done that consistently over the course of his career. Now, it's a tiny sample size and, and I'm always a little iffy, a little dubious about how, you know, guys who are – have those outlier stretches uh, the way that Ingram did with his shooting. But, but he's just so talented. He has so many skills that that are valuable in the NBA. And the other thing, too, is LeBron has never had another small forward on his team that is capable of all of the things that Ingram is is able to do. And like I said earlier in the show, that James wants to move off the ball. Like, according to all of these reports, James is really interested in 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 kind of pushing some of the creative responsibilities onto other people. And. Lonzo isn't that kind of guard in the half court set 
the guy who seems to stand to benefit the most in that respect is Ingram. And if he can prove early on that he is worthy of that of those responsibilities, look out. He's going to be an interesting guy. Like he's he's ranked on Yahoo's 128. His ADP is 107. I think that's totally fine. But I think if you're expecting yeah. him to be that guy, like in the post All Star break period, he was the 30th ranked player. It was only six mm-hmm. games, but he's not going to be that sort of a level of guy. He's probably going to see a dip on those five assists per game that he saw last season. Even if it's marginal, that can still have an impact. He blocked, he doubled his block rate in the post All Star break period versus the other portion of the season. So maybe that isn't quite able to be as high as it was there. But if he can keep those block numbers up, then the value does appear, and he's got to keep that uh, ability to be efficient. And if he can build on that, which is a huge possibility heading into his third season with more talented players around him, he might be able to build that efficiency up. He's a decent guy to have a look at there but I think just extrapolating that second half of the season and thinking well this is what Ingram is going to be it, it takes it's no. not using context in the uh, the way that he played then and the other guys who are going to be on this team so it, it is going to be an interesting scenario to see exactly how he uh, works out for this coming season in a, in a pivotal third year for Brandon Ingram the two-way guys on this team, you've referenced already Alex Caruso, Travis Ware's the other guy. Uh, they played quite a bit, the two-way guys, last season, but as you've referenced already, there's just not going to be anywhere near as many opportunities this season for the two-way guys to really get uh, get meaningful minutes, and I think we'll see them uh, pretty much right down the bottom in terms of games played and minutes played on this team. Yeah, neither, neither two-way guy, unless injuries really wreak havoc to the Lakers roster, neither two-way guy... I mean, Tra- Travis Ware has like four guys who do a lot of the same thing ahead of him on on the depth chart. Alex Caruso. Now, again, if if Lonzo Ball's injury woes continue and he plays fewer than sixty games again, or if he pl- if he plays fewer than fifty five games again, then Car- Caruso is going to be leaned on uh, fairly heavily because they just they just have to. I I think. Injuries aside, though, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any kind of gamble or wager on either two-way guy having an impact on this team. This team played as one of the fastest teams in the NBA last season. Do you think that with the arrival of LeBron, who who is known to be somewhat of a slower type of player, not not a slow type of guy, but a guy that does slow things down a little bit, do you think the Lakers will continue that pace, or, or things just ease off a little bit? No, they they all want to, by several accounts, want to get out and run. And I think LeBron has has played slow in the sense that like when he has the ball, it makes sense to slow the game down. He's so smart and he's so able to take advantage of, of every weakness in front of him that it, that it kind of makes sense to slow the game down and, and limit the possessions so that he can be more more efficient in those possessions. But for this Lakers team, they're built to run. I mean, they only have. JaVale McGee is their their only is the guy who's supposedly going to start at center and he can only play stretches of like 10 to 15 minutes at a time because of his asthma issue. Ivica Zubats is is the other I guess quote unquote traditional center on the roster but he's kind of a gamble. So you have a bunch of guys, you have a ton of wings who just want to, you know, get out, switch everything and then get out and run as soon as they can get aboard. And Lonzo was so good at those hit-ahead passes that it wouldn't surprise me at all to see LeBron kind of, it, it, when he gets a rebound, look ahead and see if there's a wing ahead of him. And if he doesn't get a rebound, he's going to do a lot of leaking out. And I, I don't think there's a better guard, uh, there's a better yeah, guard in the NBA at throwing those hit-ahead passes than Lonzo was going to be next year. So watch for the Lakers to really – it's it's going they're going to be almost obscenely fast next year is how I would predict it. One thing that I, I do want to dispel, or maybe, or maybe you can uh, maybe you can disagree with me here, but people uh-huh. you know, talk about Lonzo uh, and LeBron pairing together. It's not going to work. Lonzo is going to be terrible because Lonzo is a ball dominant guard. That's just to me that is just no. blatantly false. Like he just he gets the ball and he gets rid of it. He doesn't stand around like what Rajon Rondo does and pound the ball for 10, 12, 15 seconds at a time trying to make sure he can get an assist. Lonzo gets it, and he gets rid of it, and he gets assist because he he sees these things way before they happen. So to me, Lonzo and LeBron pairing is, is a really good pair. It's not something. It's not one of those ones where Lonzo just needs to have twenty seconds of the ball in his hand each shot clock. It's just, but that seems to be a overwhelming uh, theory across many media and uh, and fans. Yeah, that's one of the ways I can tell somebody hasn't actually watched Lonzo play. 
Yeah. <laughs> he's he's so he's he's one of the things that he does really well. He has what I would call a, 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 he takes pictures of the game. He he just takes snapshots of the game before he catches the ball. So as you'll see the ball in the air, like if he gets a rebound or something like that, you'll see him kind of turn his head and he'll a lot of times catch a rebound without looking at the at the ball in it and it might try, drive some traditionalist kind of crazy but he'll get a rebound and he'll already be looking ahead to where people were at the moment before he went to go get that rebound or if the ball is rotating over to him he's already watching the defense and how that he knows he he's very aware of his own weaknesses he's he's not the kind of guy who you want to have the ball in his hands a ton so he just he gets the ball and in those situations where the ball is rotating over to him and the defense is rotating over to him, he's really good at attacking the seam that he had seen half a second before he caught it so as to get an extra dribble in there without costing the team the tip, the typical time that a dribble takes and, and finding the guy or taking the shot that he has to take. Thank you for uh, backing me up on that. We, I promise we didn't uh, discuss that in advance. I'm, I'm glad that you were able to back up my thoughts on, uh, on Lonzo Ball and his uh, alleged ball dominance. Let's have a look at the player most likely to be traded on this team. Uh, you've you've put it down as Lance Stevenson. I did not like this signing at all. I know you are in a very very similar situation. Um, is first let's start with Lance. Is he going to be an every night rotation guy? I don't think he should be. He will be early on because I don't think the team necessarily trusts. Spee. I mean, he's a rookie, right? Like Spee yeah. Mikhailuk was drafted number 47. So any team that would go into a season banking on the 47th overall pick would be making a bed that I don't think they necessarily want to sleep in. But Lance doesn't really make sense for, for that bench unit. You, their unit right now, is, as it's currently situ- situated, uh, it, without any starters on it, is Rondo, Hart, to, right now Lance, Kuzma, and Zubots. Yep. And if Lance is open to being more purely a distributor, okay, maybe that makes a little bit more sense to have another creator on the court. But that isn't always necessarily the case, even as talented a passer that he can be at times. What I would rather they have is an extra shooter out there, in this case, Sfi. And and that way you just open everything up, and the guy who will be ball dominant in the way that he traditionally prefers to be is Rajon Rondo, and he just he just works as kind of the catalyst for everybody else on that bench unit for the rare moments that they're all out there together. And and I it, it, I don't think it will take particularly long. I think 20, 25, 30 games in, you'll really start to see the Lakers wean themselves off of Lance and onto maybe staggering the minutes a little bit more or relying a little bit more heavily on Svi if if the stuff that we saw, the shooting ability that we saw over the summer uh, remains holds true or translates over. He just makes way more sense for that bench unit and 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 really everything that that the Lakers need to do. Like if like Lance shouldn't be playing with LeBron like that, no. that pairing doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So, yeah, I, I would predict I'd go so far as I don't think they find a trade partner for him because he's I just don't think he's very good. So he, he gets waived or one of those kind of situations. He is looking, you mentioned you know, that there's 10 guys there, but you didn't even include Michael Beasley or Mo Wagner or, or you know, Svi in that mix. And they could easily move in. You talk about guys that can shoot, you know, Beasley, Wagner Absolutely. and, and Svi can all shoot. And they all should be playing ahead of Lance in that type of situation. He's not a good defender. He can't shoot. He's very, very overrated in terms of what he brings. And I, I don't understand the signing. And I, I agree. I don't think he's going to be in the rotation uh, all season. He'll start there and they'll, uh, they'll wean him out of that uh, rotation as the season goes on. Mo Wagner was the 25th pick in the draft. He surprised quite a few at Summer League. He surprised me with his ability to get steals and blocks, something he wasn't able to do during his career at Michigan. This is obviously, we're talking six games versus 80 games or whatever it was that he played at Michigan. Do you think that Wagner has an opportunity with only McGee and Zubats ahead of him to be a starter at some point this season? Or is that defensive issue a real concern in uh, today's NBA? Yeah, I don't think he'll ever be starting, but it wouldn't shock me at all if he wound up leapfrogging Zubats in the rotation. Like, I think JaVale McGee's starting spot is pretty much safe because of of the things that they know. Like, they need predictability in that starting lineup. And JaVale McGee, by, with all of his shortcomings, right, like the, the asthma thing that I mentioned earlier, he's a little bit more easy to predict in terms of what he's going to do when he isn't exhausted out there. And 
when it comes to elsewhere in the rotation, like maybe they pr- they they prefer Zubats in some kind of situations against more traditional bigs, or if they want, uh, I don't even know what what would. I don't I don't understand Zubat's place on this team, frankly. But but Wagner, I could see him leapfrogging because he can step out and shoot the three pointer because he actually moved his feet fairly well in 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 the brief kind of summer games that he played in. Uh, he moved them better than I thought he would. And the other thing too is he just he tries really hard. And and that's a good place to start. And and it, the same thing can kind of be said for for Svi and and a lot of the guys. Like last year, the Lakers just tried really hard on defense. So if that kind of culture carries into next year, and Wagner just just goes out there and tries, I think he could actually carve out a little a little role for himself out there because the ability to shoot the ball from the five is going to be really important for a Lakers team that might struggle to spread the spread the floor. Yeah, this team isn't uh, necessarily filled with great shooters. There's uh, mm-hmm. uh, LeBron and Lonzo and Ingram. They've all had their uh, their struggles in terms of shooting. Of course, McGee and Zubats offer nothing there at the center position. Rondo and Lance can't shoot. So yeah, someone that can do that will be interesting. Now, if he can translate that summer league defensive ability, you know, he's provided rim protection. He got into passing lanes, was able to to knock away balls, get steals. If that all happens, then he does have that opportunity. So he's someone to keep an eye on. I wouldn't be looking to draft Wagner at this point in fantasy. No. He he could. End up maybe he turns out like Henry Allenson, like a big man who who shoots threes and struggles on defense, which is what he potentially could profile as, or he could turn into a completely different guy. There are there are a wide range of outcomes for Wagner. It's been a positive start, but. We look at guys who are in front of him, it's not like there's huge monoliths in front that he needs to jump ahead of. So if things really progress well, maybe we see a bigger role from Wagner as things move on. The Lakers also took uh, two second round picks, Isaac Bonga at 39 and Svi at 47. Bonga, he looked real raw. Uh, He's across this season, he's only 18 years of age, a uh, small forward uh, type of a player who is a ball handler who um, will barely play at all this season, I would guess. Yeah, he's he may as well be a two way player. He's going to spend the majority of his time with the South Bay Lakers. I was going to call them the defenders, but the South Bay Lakers. He he reminds me a ton. Like Laker fans will remember this guy Soon Yue, who who came into the league and he was kind of this. He was profiled as like this six nine point guard, and and they said, well, maybe if if he doesn't work out as a point guard, well, he's skilled enough to to be able to play the small forward. I really didn't like what I saw from him. Now he's only eighteen. It, it, Bonga is so he has a ton of time to to kind of grow and and see what they have there but in terms of any kind of value or any kind of production this year it's it's not going to happen I wrote, McKay Luke came out and shot really well in summer league apart from uh, the summer league final where he did struggle he's going to have that ability to hit threes but like so many guys yeah you know, like even like an Alex Sabrina say in, in Oklahoma City guys who can come out and hit threes but they can't do anything else like they don't rebound they don't get assists they don't get steals they don't get blocks they have really limited fantasy value in that sort of a scenario but as we've detailed Anthony this team needs guys who can hit threes and yeah you know, if Svi came in and played a 17 18 minute role and did it Troy Daniel style and hit two 2.2 threes or even Wayne Allen in Miami and did that because it's so desperately needed. You could see that because he seems uh, like he's he got that ability. I've heard of people throwing out ludicrous uh, comparisons of him being the next Clay Thompson, which I think people need to calm, <laughs> calm down quite a bit with that. Um, maybe the comparison is they both can't dribble, but the shooting's not there, that the defense isn't there. But look, maybe it does come, but we're just not at that level. But he's going to have somewhat of an impact this season as we've detailed already with that potential to, uh, to leapfrog Lance in the rotation. The projected starting five, Anthony, we've got uh, Lonzo, KCP, Brandon Ingram, LeBron, and JaVale McGee. Let's start with Corwell Pope, who re-signed after that one-year deal last season. Do you think that he is in any danger of being challenged for that starting role, or at least the minutes, by uh, Josh the Hitman Hart? Yes, absolutely. I really like Hart. Now, I I think part of this is maybe we're overhyping what we saw from Hart in Summer League, and he is way too old to be playing in summer league and really like after the first game it was pretty obvious that he yeah, shouldn't have probably been sh- yeah he should not have been playing but he just kept on playing and he kept on the one thing that i really wanted to see from Hart, and and he showcased it quite a bit it one of the things that he predicted heading into summer league was i just i want to dominate but not in a numbers way which this is a fantasy basketball podcast so this isn't necessarily <laughs> the greatest point to make here but he said i didn't i wanted to dominate in the way that anytime i was on the court it was very obvious that the lakers were better with me on it 
And that was the case. Every time he was on the court, he was that the Lakers were endlessly better. And uh, that isn't necessarily always the case because KCP will just have these random moments where he just takes a KCP shot. And you wonder, like, what, what, what was the thinking process there? What were you doing? And Hart is is very capable, I think, of coming into his own this year because he is an older what will be a sophomore. So I could very easily see him kind of becoming who he's going to be this year and and taking that role from from KCP because he's more able to switch up and down the rotation and and in a, for a defense that wants to switch as much as they can, Hart's ability to go down and guard some small ball fours whereas KCP is more of a perimeter guy, that's that's going to be important. Hart, we saw last season from from a fantasy point of view, when he got that opportunity at the end of the season, he was a must-own type of guy, a really strong yeah. rebounding guard who handled the ball. He shot really efficiently. He gets steals. And if he's in that starting role, then he's a, a real shot to be a top 100 player. Now, it's probably not going to happen at the start of the season, and Caldwell Pope's still going to be there you know, cutting into those minutes, even if they go to a 28-28 minute split and they play some at the three and some at the two. But Hart is a, a valuable guy. He is... Um, He's 23 at the moment, a strong rookie season, really efficient, and, and a lot to build on after that summer league. And, and like you, I wouldn't be surprised if he does take that job away from Caldwell Pope, who can be a little bit up and down in what he does. Now, as for KCP, Yahoo's got him ranked as the 77th ranked player. I don't see that from him at all. That would be a complete waste of pick number 77 or any sort of selection in that zone. Well, to be honest, to be fair though, he was the 75th ranked player last season, but I'm banking on A, him losing usage because LeBron is coming across and losing a couple of minutes there with the uh, the uh, the ascendance of, uh, of Hart there. So I don't think that he's going to be able to get back to that level that he was at last season just because of those couple of factors. I'm not, not a big fan of KCP there in that zone, whereas Hart, yeah, probably someone you look to grab off your waiver wire just given the fact that we think it might take a little bit of time for him to come in and replace KCP if that even happens happens at all. But we've mentioned this guy's name a couple of times already, Anthony, the projected starting center, JaVale McGee. You've talked about his asthma already. Um, that limits him in terms of what he can play. He hasn't played over 10 minutes per game for the Warriors for the last couple of seasons. Him being the starter doesn't mean 27 a night because he physically can't do it. What does it mean? Is it 15? Is it 19 minutes? What can he actually get to? I'd say that 19 minute range sounds about right. I. I Anything beyond that, you're the Lakers are really like his production just goes way down when he gets tired and he gets tired so quickly because of the asthma concern. And so the, I think what the Lakers are looking for from from JaVale is get us the first seven minutes of the of the first quarter, maybe a few minutes in the second quarter, get us the first seven minutes or so of the second half and then maybe a few minutes in the fourth quarter. But. And this is one of the things that might actually boost LeBron's value. They seem to be planning their rotation with LeBron playing consistent minutes at the five. And as as I, I'm as skeptic as anybody of that kind of possibility. But for JaVale, I, I think the Lakers built this roster with his asthma concern in mind. So I think he I, any more than 20 minutes I, seems out of the question for me. Yeah, I agree. I don't think he's going to get to 20. He probably, you know, I think 15 is a more realistic expectation than 20 yeah. in between. That's a, a yeah there. But what he can do is he block shots. He has a high field goal percentage and he can get rebounds and that can have value. Now on Yahoo, people are drafting him at 110. I don't see the point of it. There's no upside to get actually better than that. No. And there's probably not likely to even get to that level. So I don't really understand that. But on the flip side on ESPN, they've got him ranked at 302. That's fine. You, if you're in a deeper league, you want to grab him. He's you know, real shot to be maybe a top 150 finish and definitely a top 200 guy. So I think there is some value there with him. Also, Lonzo, as I said, 59 on uh, ESPN, 53 on Yahoo. I think he can get better than that, but there is a, a, an element of um, fluctuation in terms of what he does. In terms of guys that I look at it as maybe busts based on the rank, Ingram, they've got it 68 on uh ESPN, which I think is too high. Yahoo at 128 is perfectly fine. And then a guy we haven't really talked about too much here, the future MVP, Kyle Kuzma. ESPN has <laughs> him at 89. Yahoo's got him at 80. I um, I doubt it. I, I, I am quite skeptical of that. And I'll tell you why that is, Anthony, because last season he was the 105th ranked player and played 31 minutes per night. Mm -hmm. I just think that he might struggle to A, beat that Terms of, in terms of playing time, but also the, the usage level that he got last season and that really sky-high efficiency, he may struggle to actually meet that same level. So I agree with the assessment, and 80 seems too high. 
I, I do think though that he could finish in that kind of 100. What did he finish at last year? What what number player was he? Yeah, I could see him in that 105 to 110 range for a couple reasons. One, on that bench unit team that 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 that, that squad, if they go full 10 man rotation, he's going to be the go to scorer for in those minutes that 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 team is on the court together. Uh, so so he won't have the same usage rate consistently that he had last year. But in those bench minutes, and he's going against other teams' benches, I could see him just feasting in those kinds of situations. The other thing, too, is he didn't get to the free throw line very much at all last year. And even when he got there, he only shot 70%. I think both of those things are going to go up. I think he he really bulked up, and he really focused this offseason on bulking up. So I think he's going to be looking for a little bit more contact than he than he was looking for last year. And he's just too good of a shooter to only shoot 70% from the free throw line. So so I, I agree that 80 and in the 80s is too high to be drafting him. And again, it's 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 Kuzma. He got way too many headlines last oh, yeah. year. Uh, but but I, I do think, though, that if you can get him in that kind of 100-ish range, I, I think that's fine value. Yeah, look, that he is fine around that zone. Of course, he's going to get uh, drafted higher than that. Almost, uh, yeah. almost no doubt about that. Given the uh, the insane hype that was surrounding him last season, but again, we have to remember he is one of these guys that he's not a super strong rebounder. He doesn't get assists. He doesn't block shots. Yeah. He doesn't get steals. Um, we have to wait to see if that free throw percentage actually comes around. He hit threes and he'll score a bit. But if we're relying entirely on his scoring which is what part, basically what his value was last season, and that does dip because of the additions on this team, then his value is not going to you know, live up to that same level as us, and definitely not increase by 25 spots, which is what some of these sites are yeah. anticipating he did. Now, to be fair, in the post-All-Star break period, he was the 78th ranked player, but he played over 34 minutes per game in that time frame, and I just don't see him being able to play that. That was when Lonzo was out, Brandon Ingram was out, and he was doing basically everything for this team. So we're not in that sort of situation for Kuzma this season, and maybe things change, and maybe he is that good and does take that step forward. I have a little bit of skepticism about that in the minutes, in that sort of usage, with you know potentially three other guys there who will be ahead of him in terms of pecking order uh, versus what he was doing in that post-All-Star period last season. Yeah, the big thing for me that I'm really watching for with Lon- with Kuzma, sorry, is can he do any kind of creating for anybody yeah. else? He just he didn't have he didn't showcase those chops last year, and that's where he goes from being just a scorer, which like you can find just scorers anywhere, and you can find them well beyond where he's going to be drafted. But if because if you look at that, if you look at that bench unit, and and like I talked about earlier, Rondo is going to be doing the bulk of the creating for anybody. And if Kuzma shows that he can do any kind of creating for anybody else in that in that kind of in that bench unit, then that allows the Lakers to play a Spee Mikhailuk or or a Mo Wagner in that in that lineup. And you don't necessarily need Lance and his ability to sometimes create for others. So the Lakers are, are and, and here's the other thing too, everybody gets pumped up this time of year. You, oh, yeah. you hear nothing but positivity really, but, but everybody who has come in contact with Kuzma this year, and it's not just Lakers people, have sang his praises with how hard he works, with the amount that he focuses on the game. You see him, any picture that, that LeBron seems to be in at the Lakers facility, Kuzma seems to be just kind of his little shadow, his little his little Gamora fish, and he's, he wants to learn and do everything that he can do to learn from LeBron and and it, for what we what fantasy owners need Kuzma to be able to improve on, there's nobody better in the league for him to learn from than that James guy. Yeah, exactly. Like if he if he can get to to three assists per game, which is a fair way off where he is at the moment, then the yeah, value does rise. If he can get a steal a game, which he was only at 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.4 blocks last year, like these are not very good numbers. If they can get up, then yeah, maybe that 80 is fine. But hey, let's wait to, until we see it. It wasn't yeah. something he did in college. It wasn't something he did last season. And it's probably not going to be something he does this season. But they're the sort of things that he will need to develop in order to become that guy that can live up to that sort of spot. There's probably uh, one guy left here, Anthony, we haven't spoken about. And that is uh, Rajon Rondo, who came across on a uh, one-year $9 million contract to this team. Should be the backup on it. Many people, man, LeBron wants winners. He needs these playoff-tested veterans. How about just get good guys in there? Um, That would be an idea for me. 
<laughs> and I don't think Rondo necessarily fits into that category, but I am a, uh, a noted Rondo. Not, I'm not a hater, but I'm just someone who pushes back on the fact that he's this excellent point guard because he clearly isn't. But coming onto this team, he was the 94th ranked player last year in 26 minutes per game. I guess the question is, can he get to 26 minutes again this season or will he be you know, pushed down to those lower 20s as the primary backup? It'll be lower 20s if it's very obvious early on that he and Lonzo can't play together. And and if if Lonzo and he can't play together and if Lonzo stays healthy, then Rajon Rondo's value for any kind of fantasy owner just kind of falls into the basement. But I just think that the people who are high on Lonzo they are they are or on Rondo sorry it's it's kind of annoying that their names sound so alike but anywho if, for those who are high on Rondo they are banking on Lonzo's like it, you can you can kind of handicap players with with other guys so if you own Lonzo I think it's a pretty good idea to own Rondo as well and and it's just because of the Lonzo injury factor like that it, it's a legitimate concern with this guy that he never really had that moment where he you know, was hit or anything like that. And he missed 30 games. And and then again, this offseason dealt with, had to get surgery again, right? And so if Lonzo gets hurt and Rondo winds up being the starting point guard on a team that doesn't really employ another backup point guard that isn't on a two-way uh, deal, then he's going to he's gonna play a lot. Yeah, and I true. think there's a lot of value there. Yeah, that, look, he could come out and average nine assists in that type of scenario unless they run more Ingram or LeBron handling the ball or even Josh Hart in that situation. But in terms of pure point guards, he is the only one who'd be on the roster if Lonzo got hurt, which seems a huge possibility. Um, Rondo is also... Uh, people say, oh, Rondo and Lonzo are the same guy, but one guy's in a playoff test. That's not true. They're not the same guy. They're nowhere near the same type of player. We've illustrated that earlier on in the show. But yeah, if Rondo can still get steals. He can still get assists. He's a terrible defender but he can still get steals and rebounds. And the numbers can be there, as we saw last season. But I'm just you have to have that query whether he can get to that level of playing time that he saw in New Orleans. And if Lonzo is healthy, he's improved his shooting, then Rondo's not going to get to that level. But he is worth taking a look at if that situation with Lonzo isn't resolved by the time the season kicks off. Anthony, I reckon, uh, I reckon that might do us for talking about the Lakers here. Um, first of all, tell everyone where they can find you and... Uh, and uh, comment really, really kindly to you on Twitter. Oh, I'm I'm really popular on Twitter and especially on Reddit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but but you can find me at Anthony Irwin LA. You can find uh, the show that I host, Locked On Lakers. It's at Locked On Lakers on on Twitter as well. Uh, you do great work, Josh. Keep up the good work. Thanks, man. Uh, Anthony also hosts Locked On NBA, one of the days that I don't host it during the week. Anthony, what what have you actually got happening on Locked On uh, Lakers this week? Give a plug of the shows that are coming out. Well, we're doing because we we partnered up with with Ease. I've been having to go back to five shows a week or five show a day, five shows a day. We're doing player previews. So the most recent one we just did was on Rajon Rondo, and and it actually turns out he makes some sense for the team. Uh, we've done LeBron, we've done Lonzo, we've done Ingram, and and we're carrying down all the way through the roster. It's it's been a fun series so far. So make sure you are checking out Locked On Lakers, subscribing to that, and subscribing to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Give it a comment. Give it a five-star rating. Hit us both up on Twitter, Anthony and myself at RedRock underscore Beeble. Anthony, thanks for coming on for the uh, third year in a row. Thanks for having me. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Kyle Kuzma.